This video is brought to you in part by DraftKings. More on them in a bit. There are 16 different mainline versions of Nickelodeon Avatar video games, and I played all of them hoping to find one single game in this lot that's more than okay to good. Go further into the weeds and there are closer to 60 different Avatar games, and don't worry if you couldn't tell by this video's length, I'll talk about those too. From the infamous Xbox 360 Achievement Game, to the 3DS's Legend of Korra Fire Emblem clone, to a top-down Zelda game, there's a lot to carve through here. There's even a review of the newest game, Quest for Balance, at the end of this video, and it's somehow the worst one of them all, besides the gotcha game. Review code provided by the publisher. Since many of these games don't get talked about much, the handheld versions especially, we're going to go through each and every one and talk about the Avatar games themselves and their development histories because all of these games, when put together, actually mirror the tumultuous backstory of both The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra's show's productions. And yep, we'll talk about the TV side of this history too. These games have been the last two months of my life, so if you find yourself having fun, consider subscribing. It's free, and it might help mend the hole in my soul left by some of this journey. It, it probably won't, but it would, it would make me feel better. Now, how many of these Avatar games were actually good games? M more than just okay? I I'm, I'm gonna say three. Uh, actually, actually, no, two. This is the complete Nickelodeon Avatar video game series retrospective thing. I I'm gonna go get a beer. One of the fundamental issues with the Avatar video game series is that it's based on a show whose network for nearly the entire two decades of its existence up until now didn't fully recognize what it had or how to handle it. The first season of Avatar The Last Airbender began airing in late February 2005, and even from the jump, it was one of the most successful shows Nickelodeon had ever had, albeit with a catch. See, the show was just as popular with slightly older kids as it was the network's key demographic of 6 to 11 year olds. That should be a good thing, you would think, but it also meant that the commercials that usually aired alongside, say, Spongebob might not fit as well with Avatar's audience. Let's give Nickelodeon the benefit of the doubt here and not say much about how the network already had an entire block of live-action shows aimed at that same older demographic, which should have made the process of selling slightly different ad time much smoother to handle. Although the folks producing the show would lean into this demographic info and provide a more mature show that could still appeal to the younger crowd, Nick took a long, long time to really recognize what it had with Avatar. Early on, Nickelodeon aired reruns of Avatar episodes out of order in random time slots, just like it was used to doing with almost every other show in its lineups at the time, shows that didn't have a serialized story. This was the first of many disputes with the showrunners, who pushed to have the reruns aired in some semblance of order rather than, say, airing the Great Divide filler episodes several times a week, at least once, supposedly even two times in a row. After first failing with a number of other strategies, the network finally caved, and it immediately bumped the ratings for both reruns and new episodes. Go figure. There are so many other examples of this sort of network malpractice. For example, the show was technically cancelled for a bit in between seasons 2 and 3, despite posting some of the highest ratings in Nickelodeon history at the time, and seeming to match even Spongebob week to week. It's what makes the more recent Avatar revival all the more fascinating. It's a franchise that quickly became one of Netflix's top shows when it first started streaming there, spending an at-the-time record two straight months in the top 10 most-watched shows list. That part is arguably why Viacom showed a sudden interest in milking the series for all it's worth to try and make people pay for Paramount+. Plus. Nobody is paying for Paramount+. Plus. New shows, new movies, a whole cinematic universe led by the original show creators who were poached away from the live-action Netflix adaptation, and, of course, new video games, both of which so far are just bad. Worse, even, than the earlier games, which were mostly your standard low-budget THQ licensed affairs. We'll talk more about those new bad ones later, because boy, boy, do I have words for them. First, THQ. By the time the first season's finale aired in December 2005, Nickelodeon had begun working with publisher THQ to develop an Avatar tie-in game, continuing a long-running partnership between the two. THQ, as it always did, released the game on every platform under the sun. When it released in late 2006, the Avatar The Last Airbender video game, named Avatar The Last Airbender, was one of the final games for both the GameCube and the original Xbox, one of the first games for the Wii, one of 
the, the games for the PS2, PSP, GBA, and DS, and a completely different game even came out on Windows. And naturally building off the hype of Season 2, which was already almost done by the time the game came out, this became Nickelodeon's top-selling game in the year 2006, which would hopefully mean that going forward, the budget would bump up a bit, right? Right? <laughs> Altogether, there are five different versions of this first game to look at, which is part of why I recently started drinking. THQ Australia developed the console versions, fellow Australian developer Halfbrick handled the GBA version, which plays like a light Zelda-styled adventure game? Japanese studio Tose, known for, and this is not a joke, providing zero creative input into just about any of the actual thousands of games that it turns out, made the DS and PSP games each one different from one another, and a studio named Aw Productions handled the Windows release. That last one is the outlier in that it just retells the first season's plot despite releasing only weeks before season 2's finale. It also looks and plays like... like, like, like this, so that's about as far as I'm gonna go in talking about it because... because... Phew. The rest feature the same original story that starts right near the end of Season 1, with Aang and Katara in the middle of their waterbending training at the Northern Water Tribe. One of the village's benders has suddenly gone missing, seemingly dragged away by metal machines of some sort. Zuko and the Fire Nation attack the city and capture Katara, although Aang and Sokka do rescue her the very next level. In the process, though, they learn of the Fire Nation's plans to create an army of machines using a kidnapped architect named Leon, which sends the Avatar gang on a goose chase through a bunch of Earth Kingdom villages, and mostly just Earth Kingdom villages, trying to find Leon to rescue her and all of the different people seemingly captured by those machines. It saddens me to say that this console game here is one of the better Avatar games even to this day, because it means that we're mostly going downhill and my liver will not like that. THQ Australia, for whatever reason, chose to make this kid's martial arts cartoon an action RPG in the vein of games like Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance, Champions of Norath, or X-Men Legends, except without the co-op that those games have. Over the course of the game, you'll be able to swap on the fly between Aang, Katara, Sokka, and Haru, who's just kind of here to fill a token Earthbender slot. The party members you're not actively controlling will engage with enemies on their own as well, albeit in a dumb AI kind of way rather than being super helpful most of the time, and everybody has their own set of basic beat-em-up combos, unlockable ability trees, and, most importantly, their own set of basic DDR sequences to activate environmental secrets like hidden chests. These are all over each of the game's levels, and it's really fun to play the guessing game of which character actually opens this. Sometimes Aang can unearth buried chests, despite that being something you would expect the earth-bending character to do, for example. It's, it's, it's really weird. And it's swapping between characters during these moments that made me realize the game doesn't clearly highlight which directional button corresponds to which character, one of those tiny little details that starts to grind at you when you're six hours into the game. Since you almost always have two characters with you, and the few times you don't, they could have just added a second character and slightly tweaked the story, or really not even tweaked the story at all, you don't really need to, co-op really would have helped cut down on this game's more tedious moments, but alas. The RPG parts of this game, simple as they are, are really interesting for an Avatar tie-in, in that I don't quite get why this game is the way that it is, but I don't dislike it. Each of the game's seven freely explorable levels features a handful of side quests that grant money, experience, or even a piece of legendary armor, because this game has both randomized tiered loot drops and gold legendary armor. It's, again, really weird to see in an Avatar game. Objectives for both the main and side missions can mostly be completed out of order if you choose to explore first, which you wouldn't really expect out of a licensed children's game where half the time everything is phoned in. But no, even the very start of Avatar The Last Airbender on console lets you explore and find key items like the missing waterbender's pouch early even before you get that quest so that you can complete quests right as they're given to you. There's custom dialogue options as well so that you can just say, oh, I have that already in the same conversation, which you just, it's weird. It's like, good RPGs don't do that sometimes. There's a crafting system for both items and gear. The merchants have a buyback option in case you accidentally sell the wrong one of your 40 different panda robes you picked up in fights. It's all more involved than you would assume going in. The combat, not as much but it's at least okay. Outside of a basic one-button combo that just gets longer as you level up and a block button, the game's main appeal is in the character's unique abilities that utilize your chi meter. Everybody has a set of offensive and defensive moves that are unique to them, using their bending or Sokka's club, and further still, each character has a unique third set of abilities. Aang's only an airbender in this storyline, so he can distract enemies by zooming around on an air scooter. Katara can heal her allies. Sokka, well, well, he has more club moves, but they function more like temporary stat buffs than just throwing the club more. Haru, 
uh, again, he is just kind of here, so he doesn't have a third moveset to upgrade. I do wish we got a combat system a bit more expressive or combat more representative of the really cool martial arts stuff you see in the Avatar show, but given the style of game, this was probably the best way to highlight each character's unique traits. It's just weird that, for example, we never use Aang's air glider in gameplay, one of those things that you just expect would exist for at least some platforming or something, and yet almost none of the Avatar games ever touch his staff or air glider really at all. Most of the enemies you'll encounter in this game will be Fire Nation soldiers or wild animals like the platypus bear. Those guys in particular give a ton of experience, but as the game goes on you'll encounter more and more of that machine army. The game kind of implies that they're invincible, but they're not, they're just a little harder to take down since, you know, metal. And each type of mechanical enemy corresponds to a different element, as if their designs were based on benders. Also, in the Omashu City level there are just a bunch of stray cats. Sokka apparently takes joy in beating up cats. You deserve that! The levels can get a bit samey in the middle of the game, like when we jump from an earthbending village in Chapter 2 to an earthbending village in Chapter 3, this time in a slightly different forest, but by and large they're really fun to explore. Omashu may get a bit mazy at times, and the air temple level and surrounding village actually understay their welcome a bit, despite coming during the more tedious let's end the game already please chunk of the game, but as a kid, and even today, I really enjoyed getting to run around in some of the neatest looking areas or concepts of areas from that first season. Plus, you can get arrested for destroying the cabbage salesman's cabbage cart, which is just great. Another neat thing that, again, you just wouldn't expect from a licensed game like this is that as you level up, by default the game automatically assigns your upgrade points to specific ability unlocks or buffs, you know, the kind of stuff you might expect them to want to do for a kid's game that maybe doesn't need to be as advanced as they made it. But if you swap to manual upgrading, you can actually undo where prior experience points went to better fit your build. I just wish that customizability and attention to detail mattered much in a game where, say, you could revisit old level hubs. Here, once you move on, you are not ever allowed to go back. Yeah, for as many small details that this game may nail, little bits of world building, like having you sneak into a Fire Nation camp in armor and learn that there's a bit of infighting between a corrupt captain who keeps upping local taxes on the earthbending villages and a just captain who wants to see that stopped, or little bits of dialogue that fit well with the tone of the show, Sokka especially, or even just that when you play as Momo to pick up fetch quest collectibles, humans all have that same Charlie Brown style mumbling that they do in the show whenever you see Momo's perspective. Sadly, for as many of these sorts of details, there are at least as many that get missed, more in line with the stuff you would expect from a licensed game. The game has huge balancing issues, where some attacks just absolutely wreck the game and give you no reason to experiment. I mean, I never once used any of the defensive abilities for any of the characters because they didn't matter, they just, they just made the game last longer. The character models are definitely a little bit off, even by wonky 2D to 3D translation standards, and the returning voice cast from the show definitely didn't get much help by way of direction this time around. And that's compounded by the game having that thing where not much effort was ever put into sound design, so all the cutscenes that do have voices are just played over awkward silence. A lot of the game just doesn't have music at all. It's, it's kind of weird. And as fun as it may be to explore on your own before picking up any of the quests, one or two side quests can in fact get softlocked if you do bits out of order, meaning you'll never get to 100% completion on that chapter that you can never revisit anyway. The horror. Moreover, pieces from those special gear sets sometimes are only given to you by an unmarked character well after finishing a quest, which means that you can easily miss them if you don't think to leave and come back and talk to a person a third time after they've already thanked you. The gear and shop menus, ambitious as they are, aren't exactly good, as the D-pad swaps your current hero like I mentioned earlier, and the analog stick is sensitive in this game, so you'll frequently find yourself swapping between menu tabs on accident when just trying to scroll up or down that page of your inventory, and swapping tabs resets you to the top of the list. That happens quite a bit, it's actually really annoying. None of it hurts the game individually, besides that one, but it adds up on top of an okay enough gameplay experience to take away a bit of the game's charm factor, the replayability stuff especially, and that drives this game from something that I would actually call pretty good to, yeah, it's alright, but still somehow disappointing. How many times do you want to bet I'm gonna end up saying exactly that in this video? Speaking of bets, you can place yours with the sponsor of today's video, DraftKings. Well, not how many times I'm going to say that an Avatar game is disappointing, but, but bets and... You, you know what I mean, roll the ad. Now, if there's anything that goes hand-in-hand hand with video games, it's gambling. Ask loot boxes, or 
or, or hedgehogs. That dude's been in casinos from day one. And since all of us here like to have fun without leaving our houses, why not responsibly check out DraftKings Casino? It's America's number one online casino with hundreds of different real money games. For every new customer who signs up using the promo code GOLDENBOLT and deposits at least $5, DraftKings is matching that deposit dollar for dollar up to $500 in casino credits. With over 175 slot games to choose from, including classic favorites and an assortment of DraftKings exclusives, there are so many ways to have fun. At least 175 of them. I mean, that's right there in the name. Or if DraftKings Casino isn't available yet in your state or region, check out their daily fantasy app where you can win cash prizes all season long. Which season? I'm trying to start up a pie show league, but it turns out that uh, that doesn't exactly have players per se. So it's it's a work it's a work in, work in progress. Most importantly, DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. If any of that sounds up your alley, click my link below and use the code GOLDENBOLT when signing up to get up to $500 matched in casino credits. And of course, most importantly, play responsibly. Thanks again to DraftKings for sponsoring this segment and making this massive video possible, and now, let's get back to it. To close out the story before we move on to the handheld versions and just make things a little bit easier here, that Leon girl making the machines? Well, she's the villain, which is obvious pretty quickly in this game. She's actually got some interesting motivation, though, fearing that Aang won't have time to finish learning all the elements before the Fire Nation wins the war. So she teams up with some of those quote-unquote kidnapped benders to create the machines and eventually creates a mechanical avatar analog to try and take down the Fire Lord. Problem is, this plot revelation kind of comes super late in the game after a bunch of goose chasey runaround. There's never a true encounter with Zuko either. He just kind of appears every two to three levels just in time to miss the Avatar gang or to get knocked out by something else. Kind of makes him feel like a, a geek. And speaking of geeks, Haru is still just here. Like, he's looking for his friend, that's his plot motivation, and that friend turns out to be one of those earthbenders working with the machine maker, but his part of the story is so shoehorned that he's an NPC in the Game Boy version. That's how little he matters. And in this game, at least, the mechanical avatar boss fight is way easier than you'd like to see out of something that's trying to replace the avatar. It works out well that the game addresses a lot of the same concerns that the show would end up doing in seasons 2 and 3 about whether Aang can finish his training in time, and it showcases really well the plight of the people that have been forced to live under the Fire Nation's boot for years or decades, but it's also using early season 1 Aang characterization, where he's a little bit lazy and likes to goof off. In better hands, the story could have been more interesting than the mostly nothing it ends up being. At the end, Aang goes into the Avatar state after Katara gets knocked out defending him. He absolutely wrecks the mechanical Avatar that was already easy to begin with, so it doesn't really feel super cool or anything, and then he waxes about how everybody has a role in getting him ready, and now he realizes he can't mess around too much, seemingly to try and make the game fit nicely back into the plot of the show, as if this could be semi-canon. Thankfully, the GBA version of this game is something that I can actually recommend in general, as it's a far better game than the if you played it when it came out and want a nostalgia hit, pick it up energy that the console version exudes. That's because Halfbrick, the Australian developer that later went on to make Fruit Ninja of all games, chose to make Avatar into a Zelda game. Kinda. As I usually try to do with my videos, I reached out to some of the folks involved in development to get an idea of why they took this Zelda approach, and what it was like making the game on a shorter timeline. Go figure, the game's director, John Cartwright, is a pal of mine. He had this to say. Oh, I didn't work on that. That was a different John. I would have been like six, and I've never lived in Australia. The Game Boy version of Avatar follows the same story as the console game, with some levels removed such as the entire Earthbender village that we find Haru in, which made me laugh because again, he just has no purpose in this story at all. It's not even his village we went to in the console game, he just happens to be in a different village that the Avatar gang just shows up in. A anyway, instead we control just the main Avatar trio in a sort of Four Swords gameplay style where all three characters follow around at once. At certain points, like utilizing Sokka's unique ability to open a lever, you can split the gang up to solve solo puzzles and open dungeon doors or find hidden health upgrades. I do wish the other characters didn't have active health bars during regular combat since they don't fight on their own and anyone dying at all means that you go back to the last checkpoint, but that just makes your spacing a little more important is all. Being on a system with four total buttons, the combat is pretty simple, but the puzzle part of this adventure makes up for that by showing off each hero's skills. Katara can build progressively longer ice bridges to travel across, or simply move water from one container to another in order to, for example, give a block enough weight to push down a switch. 
Aang's got an air blast that can easily push heavy blocks out of the way, and later he can push air through vents. Sokka gets a circular boomerang throw to operate multiple switches at once, and later he gets bombs, because again, Zelda. We all know that Zelda invented the concept of bombs. I was continually impressed with how the game organically introduces new wrinkles to the adventure and to the puzzles, frequently splitting the gang up and having you swap back and forth between them as one opens the door for the other, who opens the door for the third, etc., while avoiding any soft locks that could have easily resulted. My favorite part, though? In this game, those machine enemies are unkillable through regular combat, which is what the console game kept saying, but never actually showed us. Instead, they too are puzzles. You'll have to guide the tank enemies onto a vent so that Aang can flip it with a well-timed air blast. Katara physically pulls the water out of the water bending machines, which makes for some fun puzzles as you force it to chase you through an area just to transport the water that you need to progress at the end. Even one of the early game bosses at the Northern Water Tribe goes from being a thing you hit a bunch on console to a more thought out encounter where you have to knock it down from its perch to be able to start damaging it. Avatar on Game Boy may be only three hours long, but man, it is such a fun three hours. Only a few times did I feel it actually slowed down at all, particularly near the end when the game forces you to operate all three characters simultaneously and perfectly as you run with, again, near-perfect timing to avoid a giant mech chasing you down a corridor. It is such a tense section of the game that I really enjoyed it first, before it quickly became annoying when the controls start to let you down a bit. But it's still worth it to get through that final dungeon to fight the final boss, a three-pronged puzzle where each hero takes down part of that mechanical avatar bit by bit before Aang deals the final blow. That brings us to the Tosa developed versions of Avatar on the DS and PSP. The DS version is cut from the same mold as the console game, but obviously scaled back significantly. Unlike the console game, you can surprisingly control the camera here, in that Xenogears kind of 2D art mapped over a 3D world sort of design. Enemy encounters are pushed out from the overworld into their own battle arenas as if it was a JRPG as well, and it feels a bit punchier as a beat-em-up game compared to the console game at the cost of being much weaker as an RPG. There are also a few additional text cutscenes that help flesh out some of the gaps in the console version's story, mainly explaining better the stuff that leads you from one chapter into the next, and these bits of text feel fairly accurate to what you would expect from the characters, which is always nice considering half the time licensed handheld game dialogue from this era felt just so forced simply to get from point A to point B with as little effort as possible. I would not at all be surprised if these scenes were things written for the console game that just got cut to limit time in the voiceover booth or something. Now, there's not a ton to say about this version, it's very cookie cutter. It does have a couple other changes, like a weird herb mixing mechanic in place of all the randomly generated armor and loot on console. By mixing different herbs together, you can get more powerful buffs or healing items. However, every herb is named Herb A, B, C, etc., rather than anything descriptive. Remember, Tose prides itself on not adding anything to its games. It does exactly what it's told, and nothing more. Needless to say, once I saw this, I stopped combining the herbs since it was already a bit unnecessary to begin with, with how easy the game is. The last thing I'll add is that there are once again a bunch of side quests like in the console game, and there's even a different version of this in-universe board game called Four Nations. On console, Four Nations was essentially dominoes, but with the four elements. Either match the tiles till you run out, or until the opponent has no matching tiles left and loses. Here on DS, it's a different game called Four Nations Force, which is this weird 4 versus 20 checkers kind of game. If you're the side with four, representing of course the four bending elements, the goal is to defeat enough enemies by hopping over them checker style before the other player can finish placing one of their pieces down on the board once per turn. If you're the team with 20, which represents, I guess, regular people, the goal is to surround the four before losing too many pieces so that the four can't move. It's kind of neat, although the AI is a bit too good and the board a bit too small for you to really be able to win as the four-piece side, even in the tutorial. Honestly, one of the worst parts of putting this video together was discovering that the console Four Nations minigame wasn't as cool as I remembered it being as a kid. Somewhere along the line, I guess my brain turned it into something far bigger than it actually ever was. Maybe I was drinking back then, too. Part of why I saved this PSP version for last is that it's a weird fusion of every other release, except maybe the Windows one. It uses level layouts that are closer to the DS game, which makes sense because it's made by the same studio at Tose. And it also uses an armor crafting and upgrade system similar to that DS game. But it features an in-world battle system like the console game had, rather than loading you into a separate square combat area. The other part of why this one is last is because I kind of just assumed until about the 11th hour that this would be another scaled-back console port like most PSP games were by 2006. Turns out, 
No, I'm, I'm glad I checked. And by glad, I mean I am not glad that I checked, but, but here we are. Like the DS game, this one features a handful of cutscenes also not in the console version, and it even does a few of them differently from that DS version. For example, in the second level on every version except for Game Boy Advance where the second level doesn't really exist, Aang and Sokka put on some Fire Nation soldiers smelly armor to sneak into the jail. On console, they use the armor more for a completely unrelated base in the level that's not featured in any other version. On DS, Aang flings Sokka across the pond to sneak into the back door instead of just walking right into the main base using the weird invisibility stealth button that the console game also has. Didn't mention that earlier. Yeah, you just, you just press circle and you go invisible. Don't know why. Meanwhile, on PSP, Aang uses his staff to glide across while holding Sokka, who loses his grip and falls into the drink anyway. Where the console game features a voiced cutscene to show the smelly soldiers in question being yelled at by their boss, the PSP game has a fight sequence just outside of the bath area where you steal that armor. There's even a PSP exclusive side quest, which I can guarantee you is not on the back of the box, that requires you to sneak back into the base to retrieve a lady's stolen precious gem, which itself features a different cutscene where the Fire Nation has now blocked that back entrance, so Aang says that he and Appa will cause a distraction while Sokka runs right in the front door and fights his way to the treasure chest alone. It's kind of annoying that, unlike the console game, you can't achieve most mission objectives early, so you can't grab that gem before you actually get the quest to tell you to grab the gem, and you have to go back later. And speaking of the side quests, this game also has a bit of a different experience and moveset level up system, wherein completing quests actually does something more useful than sometimes give you some cool armor or herbs on DS. Here, leveling up simply bumps up your stats, and you instead need to use this separate upgrade currency to buff the power or speed of each character's moves. You only get that upgrade currency by finishing things like side quests, and the entire party shares that pot, so you can just move to make one character overpowered early, at the cost of the others potentially struggling a bit. There's a decent variety of moves here for you to choose from and upgrade. Aang's air scooter is unlocked right from the start, and for once lets you speed through the overworld rather than slowly half-walk, half-jogging. Sokka's bombs, which only appeared in the GBA game, show up at the start of this game as well, and they're immediately needed for progression. Although this side of the upgrade stuff is cool, the armor upgrade crafting system thing is a bit superfluous, which is what makes it nice that sometimes there are repeatable side quests where characters will ask you to trade them those materials for some of that moveset upgrade currency instead. I didn't really understand what the intent was with the armor in this version outside of the surface level armor stat go up, because every piece also defends against one particular element. This is in a game where you don't really fight enough of those machines for that to be worthwhile, and where the only other enemies you fight are animals that don't have bending, or the Fire Nation, so you should just beef up all of your fire defense armor and win. Even then though, most of the Fire Nation soldiers don't actually fire bend, so I'm not even sure if their regular hand-to-hand -hand attacks or spears or whatever would actually have lower damage there. Huh. In general though, if the combat wasn't kind of dreadful, I'd actually say this might have ended up being the best version of the game. You've still only got one button for regular attacks, that's your entire combo button, and man, the attack motions for each character are, are just kind of hilarious. Aang simply flails his arms around, no wonder he's only doing one damage per hit. Enemies frequently fall down after a one or two hit combo and you have to wait for them to get back up. They're all damage sponges, reinforcements show up several times per fight sometimes, it's all, it's all just mwah, chef's kiss. The reinforcements part does hit well on the idea that you're fighting an actual army, Team Avatar should be overwhelmed by the Fire Nation, but the fact that I had to spend essentially my entire upgrade balance from the first third of this game to get Aang's hand-to-hand -hand combos to do more than 1-2 to two damage per hit when any other attack besides your basic hand-to-hands requires Chi to fire off and does 10 times as much, yeah, yeah, it's not, not very balanced at all. Not to say the game's hard or anything, it's very, very easy. Just uh, call it Final Fantasy X's protagonist, Tedious. Altogether, if you could fuse every version of this first Avatar game together, this weird PSP fusion included, you would probably have a gem on your hands. But also, if you could do that, you'd probably have an equal chance of creating some unspeakable monstrosity. So just play the GBA game, if anything. Let's move on to... Oh. Oh, it's the, it's the achievement game. Avatar The Burning Earth, the Season 2 tie-in game which released near the end of 2007, right after the show's third season had premiered. This is somehow a timing improvement on the first game. Due to that semi-cancellation of the Avatar franchise after Season 2, Season 3 started airing in the fall TV season rather than in the spring like the first two had. 
by chance with the way things shook out, weeks before Avatar Season 3 premiered, Nick found another ratings juggernaut in iCarly, a show that broke just about every ratings record the network has ever had. A ratings juggernaut whose seemingly successful Paramount Plus revival was just cancelled after a few seasons. I'm sure that bodes well for the Avatar cinematic universe. Woo. Anyway, one last nugget of TV lore before we get to the game here. Fun fact, in case you don't recall this, the first half of Avatar's third season aired weekly, like most of the series did. The second half was burned in a single week, from July 14th to 19th, 2008, and despite that, it proceeded to draw 19 million total viewers across that week, every episode on average reaching more than 7% of all kids watching TV at each episode's airtime in the US. Golly gee, boy oh boy, I hope this is the last time they burn an entire season of an Avatar show all at once just to get it out of the way. I mean, that can't ever happen again, right? <laughs> right? The Burning Earth has three distinct versions. Another DS game developed by Tose, another Game Boy game developed by Halfbrick, and another console game developed by THQ Studio Australia. Let's get the single thing anybody knows about this game out of the way first. The Xbox 360 release was one of the first achievement games, because you could get all 1000 gamer score in the tutorial simply by executing an easy 50 hit combo. Back in the day when people still thought achievements mattered, you would look at somebody's profile and if you saw this game, you immediately discounted them as a fraud. When asked why the achievements were so pathetically easy to get, THQ Australia's director of production, John Cartwright, had this to say. I already told you we're not the same guy. Read the f***ing line, John. <sighs> we weren't overly surprised that adults could get the achievements as quickly as they did. If someone's been playing fighting games for years, then the achievements in Avatar are not going to challenge them too much. But again, we're not targeting that gamer. We try to focus on the thrill a young kid would get when he slash she gets his slash her first achievement. Can I go now, please? In fact, it's functionally impossible to beat this game without getting all of the achievements. Three quarters of players who have ever played The Burning Earth on Xbox 360 have every achievement, and that's counting the 6% of accounts who loaded the game up and then seemingly never got past the title screen. That's a weird thing that happens with games. If you look at any game's achievements ever, like 10% of accounts never get the first achievement. It's wild. That 75% completion rate is why I went out of my way to avoid getting any achievements for as long as possible here. It was a point of pride for me. More on that in a sec. First, Avatar The Burning Earth, despite being a Season 2 game, only covers the first half of Season 2, up through the Drill episode. It does so in a way that doesn't even complement those episodes either, because they just jump from one plot to the next without any of the connecting tissue. This is an issue for actually almost every other Avatar game from this point on as well. Yay! It is the worst kind of licensed game tie-in faux pas, a game that fully expects you to not only have seen, but also fully remember every bit of the media it's tying into in order to not be lost. Characters randomly show up sometimes as if they've been in your party for the entire chapter despite never being acknowledged once. Zuko and Iroh, outside of one cutscene, are missing the entire game up until the very end. Jet shows up with no explanation at all of who he is. Hell, there's an entire level in the swamp that focuses on you playing as Katara and Momo, which leads to a bit of whiplash not just because you're fighting as Momo, but also because Jet shows up during this mission to get him in the playable crew faster, despite this being 10 episodes before he would actually have appeared in the show. The game also suffers from what I call being a Nintendo Wii game. The version I'm playing here on 360 is simply a graphically improved version of the PS2 and Wii version, but because the games are otherwise identical, there's no camera control, and the right stick, which doesn't exist on the Wii, has no function at all. In fact, much of this game is pared back and simplified from the original Avatar game, now just being a generic beat-em-up. There's technically leveling up, but just by playing the game, you'll obtain more than enough of the yellow experience orbs needed, especially when things like hidden treasure chests or health upgrades are almost always right in plain sight, rarely even hidden behind a puzzle or platforming challenge. They're just right there. You can upgrade your ranged attacks, combo power, or your special moves, each of them three times for nine total upgrades, except there are only like five combos in the game, which are the same for each character, and the special moves don't even really matter until near the end of the game, since you can only use them when you pick up a special item. The chapters are mostly linear, there's not really any reason to backtrack, it's just a three-ish hour straight shot of a video game. Thankfully, at least this time around we've got full co-op, but that actually means more chances to rack up combos and accidentally score an achievement. 
The idea of not getting a 10 hit combo in a beat em up game already sounds kind of hard, but it's harder than it sounds. You have to pay constant, unwavering attention, especially since hitting multiple enemies at once, surprisingly, correctly counts as multiple hits toward that combo meter. These aren't time sensitive combos either, the only way to reset your combo is to get hit or to swap characters if you're playing alone. The consequence of avoiding combos in Burning Earth is that in this game, your damage dealt is proportional to the length of your combo meter. If you're actively avoiding getting the achievements, things like this boss fight in the swamp take 15 plus minutes. It was during this boss fight that I accidentally got the 20 hit achievement because my brain just turned off for one single moment and that's enough to do it. I'd already gotten the 10 hit achievement earlier in the game when I got greedy during an 8 hit combo and accidentally hit one too many enemies instead of just swapping characters and being safe. And at that point, since I already had that achievement, I took advantage of it and went for 15 hit combos to speed the game up. After messing up and getting the 20 hit achievement, I was clean for the remaining two thirds of the game, so I only have those two achievements. Again though, this was harder than it sounds because there are several segments where the game wants you and your AI or human partner to line up in several spots on screen where you're shooting bending attacks over and over again. Where the AI allies are sometimes useful outside of boss fights when they just jump in the air a bunch for no reason, during these particular sections they're hard coded to run right to these context sensitive paths. It makes sense, you don't want the AI to not do the thing it needs to do for you to progress, like when Momo and Katara are putting out fires together. Still can't make that one up. But you cannot swap characters once the AI partner is in place during those things until they get knocked out of them or choose to leave. And if you're going for an achievementless run, this could be the run killer. From what I found online, I haven't seen anybody that's actually pulled it off. I know that it's doable for a fact. I know there's a way to do it. It's just that if you fail, you have to create a new Xbox account every single time to start over. There's not too much more to add about the Burning Earth, despite not saying much about the game itself. I do like that Aang can waterbend on some context sensitive points, and although he just kind of learns earthbending immediately here, that's, that's always great, he can also do all of the earthbending context pads too. I don't know, it's nice for the Avatar to be able to actually use more than one element. That's rare in this series somehow. The game's ranged attacks being far and away the dominant strategy aside, I appreciate that the game at least uses the fact that benders have range, which so many Avatar games never do. Hell, the Nickelodeon Smash games barely give the benders much range either. I'll also say the library level is easily the best part of this game. It's honestly really neat. It's one long string of puzzles rather than simply mindly pressing the punch button over and over and over again like most of the rest of the game. It's nothing super special or anything, but it at least had some atmosphere to it. What else is there? Uh, oh, there are some Oppa flying levels, which is nice. Two of them on Xbox, to be exact. There's apparently a third one locked to the PS2 game as a cross-save bonus with the first Avatar game. I, I didn't care to go do that since I'm pretty confident you could win these sections without pressing any buttons at all. That's, that's how easy they are. The boss fights are okay, I guess. My favorite is the one where you can defeat the boss via Ring Out. Any chapter that ends in a boss fight pretty universally ends the same way. A boss attacks Katara during a QTE, Aang immediately turns around in the Avatar state saying, yo, you f***ed up and does the same finishing attack for every single boss, and that's it. That's the, that's the boss fight, yay. It's especially egregious later in the game, when you fight Zuko and Azula on top of the drill, and Aang does the exact same animation to end both fights back to back. It is really funny, at least, seeing how little effort went into making the buttons pop at all on screen. Like, the QTE prompts look so dull, there's no animation to them, it's the lowest budget thing about a game whose cutscenes almost never even have lip flap movements. Besides the whole mouths not moving thing, the character models look pretty okay, with some exceptions where they do end up off model. I was almost able to praise the depiction of bossing Sei's city streets, up until I moved the stick and the game started chugging at like half of its frame rate, and I ran into all of the invisible walls and identical doors that are sometimes enterable, sometimes not. Great. The voiceover work, again, isn't quite up to the quality of the show, which is funny since the actors are usually rereading lines they'd already read for the show. Oh, and I guess you could fight in the arena against your friends once you're done with the game, if you really want to. It's not, not gonna be very good, but hey, it's there. Obviously, these are still all children's games, but kids deserve better? It's a shame this one veered so hard into being an obligatory licensed cash-in, because I really do think for all the problems the first Avatar game had, it just needed some tweaking to be something pretty memorable. For this game to phone it in badly enough that the story beats are out of order or don't even make sense, for it to be half the length of that first game, it's just a letdown. Presumably, it was also a letdown sales-wise too, because the next few games locked themselves into shovelware purgatory and only released on DS, Wii, and PS2. 
Speaking of, Burning Earth's DS port was once again developed by Tose, and it's mostly the same game as the first DS port, although without the ability to control the camera this time. There are a few fixes here and there for some smaller details that I didn't hit on earlier, such as the bottom screen map being much more functional here, or moving healing items to pause screen only. That one sounds like a negative, but the first game tried to keep you running around with the D-pad while pulling out your stylus to swap menus on the bottom screen and drag a healing item to a particular character, and it wasn't very clean. The DS game follows the same plot up through the drill, although where the console game used the first episode entirely as combat tutorial, here there's a bit of exploration and side quest fodder, even a touchscreen based Katara healing minigame. Oh, and if you find all 20 cabbages throughout the game and give them to the cabbage salesman, you'll unlock the final tier of upgrades for each character. I didn't do that. Moving on to the GBA game, developer Halfbrick sadly wasn't able to carry things this time around and make a game I could actually recommend. It follows the same visual style as their first Avatar outing, going for a top-down action-adventure approach, but this game sort of cuts out most of the Zelda puzzler inspiration and instead becomes more of a time-sensitive beat-em-up, sorta? It still very much wants you to think of encounters as puzzles in its own way because of the score bonuses you get for defeating multiple enemies in a chain. Enemies appear on screen in a set pattern that appears like Half Brick wants you to memorize and learn to optimize around using the game's new support combos. One example they come back to frequently is when you play as Sokka and Aang together, Sokka's club can stun enemies, and then by pressing R you can send Aang out to do his dash attack, which sends those enemies flying into one another, sort of like bowling pins. If you fight normally and don't utilize these support combo strategies or stuff like aiming Toph's earthbending attacks in such a way to take out multiple enemies at once, good luck on getting A ranks in any level. See, here the game doesn't register combos unless you kill enemies within essentially milliseconds of one another, and even then, sometimes it doesn't seem consistent. Additionally, in an odd twist, your health is actually tied to this combo meter. You might think your health is the number next to this green potion, but that's actually just a timer for bonus points. It's the number on the top left of the screen that's your actual health bar. Every time you take a hit, you'll lose 10 from that score, and every time you defeat enemies, you'll earn points back depending on the combo number. It's a rather unique setup, but one I actually did enjoy, even if I would have liked to see them do another straight-up Zelda game. It also would have been kinda rad to let you mix up your party during level replays, but with how many levels straight-up require something like Iroh's Fire Breath or Zuko's Parry to solve specific puzzles for those characters, I get that it wouldn't have been feasible. That said, there is an A rank bonus. If you complete every one of the game's levels up through the drill with an A rank, and that's far easier said than done with how touchy some of the seemingly necessary bonus puzzles are, four more levels are then unlocked that tell the rest of the Season 2 story? Why is that content locked in a game that's only an hour long? I have no idea. I guess you could argue replayability, but if we're being real here, this game launched at like 20 bucks. Replayability was the last thing on THQ's mind when shipping out one of the final 10 or so GBA games ever released. Now, although the Game Boy Advance died, Half Brick wasn't done with Avatar games just yet, as they would be rewarded with contracts for the next two Avatar DS ports, one for the Season 3 game and one for the much-anticipated movie that Nickelodeon's executives were certain would keep the franchise relevant for years to come. First came October 2008's Avatar Into the Inferno, which also released on PS2 and Wii as developed by THQ Studio Australia once again. We'll talk about the console version second this time around, because I'm happy, well, content to report that Half Brick returned to its puzzle adventure Zelda inspirations this time around. The trade-off is, the game uses the chibi art style featured in some non-canon DVD bonus parody episode things, so it's not really fun to look at. Like with the second game, you'll take control of two set characters per level, utilizing their different bending abilities or skill sets, and you're able to split the duos up at any time to have one operate switches or solve puzzles necessary to move the other forward. Sadly, the levels are a bit too long in my opinion, and pretty repetitive at that. Like, the first two levels together are essentially 30 to 40 minutes of the same Fire Nation mechanical interiors, and there isn't enough puzzle variety to justify the lack of visual variety. It is fully co-op at least, which is really cool for a DS game, and that would help cut down a bit on the back and forth tedium when you have to cross an obstacle course with each character. Every level has five collectible Pi show tiles hidden within, almost as if they were going for a collectathon undertone for the game. If you have enough coins at the end of the level, you'll even unlock a bonus sixth one, which I thought was going to be like a Mario 64 sort of coin star bonus, before I softlocked myself messing with Aang's tornado launch move just to see if I could do that. It turns out that I can. 
That's when I learned that dying subtracts 30 coins from your score if you choose to respawn rather than start the whole level over. It's also when I learned this game doesn't have checkpoints. You respawn exactly where you died, so... So that was a fun 15 minutes of gameplay that I had to redo to get back here. The puzzles may be on the simple side, but I still do appreciate this game following in the first GBA game's footsteps and having you actually control things like water at times by pulling it out of containers and using it to hit enemies or switches. It's admittedly not much, but I'll take what I can get considering most Avatar games barely use the bending abilities at all. Plus, Katara can bloodbend enemies in this one, making this the most traumatizing game in the series despite the visuals. Last, but well, kind of least, actually. The game has a multiplayer-only volleyball mode set on Ember Island, and here's where you use those collectible Pai Show tiles. You can unlock different costumes for the main story, such as the painted lady outfit that Katara wears in the second mission, which, hey, it's more than the bare minimum, so I appreciate that they even have costume changes to fit the story, because the Wii game does not do that. Or you can use the Pai Show tiles to unlock bonus characters for the volleyball, such as... Human Proportions... Chibi... Appa... Okay, yeah, that settles it. Definitely the most traumatizing game in the series. The DS version is also better than the Wii game at actually telling the story of Season 3, since this one actually adds some conversations between the gang leading into and out of each episode. In the Wii game, things usually just happen. Like, suddenly Zuko and Sokka are just at the Boiling Rock without any explanation of why. Or when Zuko teaches Aang firebending entirely off-screen, explained away in the Overworld Chapter Select conversation. Let me tell you, the whiplash of going from this game's opening cutscene, which is the actual ending of Season 2, but completely reanimated in 3D, and done pretty well at that, the whiplash of going from that to... everything else about this game... is something else. For whatever reason, THQ Studio Australia thought it best to remove the concept of dodging and blocking... entirely, while still keeping this game's core as a beat-em-up experience. There aren't any real combos, the dominant strategy is to jump and then do your slam attack to knock enemies down, there are some upgrades that you can buy that are mostly superficial, and like Avatar on PSP, of all things, enemies have far too much health and are completely invulnerable once they get knocked down until they get back up, which leaves you waiting... constantly. Of this game's maybe two and a half hour runtime, I legitimately think you could shave at least 20 minutes off just by speeding up the enemy wake up alone. So what, you might ask, is this game's gimmick? Well, it's a Wii game first and foremost, so the gimmick is poorly implemented motion controls, here in the form of grabbing water or rocks or, 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 or fire, and taking it from one container to another to solve every puzzle. You would think using a firebender's flame punch attack would light candles, but no, 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 you gotta slowly walk while carrying this fire you found across the room and make sure not to bump anything or else you might knock it over and have to start over. This emphasis on Wii Remote Bending extends to the combat, too, as the game wants you to grab nearby elements and fling them into enemies to damage them, even though you're then a sitting duck who can't move fast while you're bending. Strangely, the emphasis on controlling your Wii Remote, that's something they actively push you to not do any other time in the game except when holding an element for a puzzle. Almost everything in your surroundings, whether it's lockers or chairs or papers on a desk, it's all interactable, or closer to destructible, really. And the game rewards you with hidden collectibles and money for flailing your controller around whenever possible. Think of it like a Lego game, but far worse. I shudder to think about what it's like to play Into the Inferno on PS2, where I'm assuming the right analog stick replaces all the motion controls. No, no thank you. The most disappointing part is that it doesn't even follow its own rules at times, despite being so short that it shouldn't have any trouble following any rules it sets up. Early on in one of the levels, you're taught by the Talking Samurai Momo tutorials that swinging water around quickly turns it into a good cutting tool, and later in that level, you're asked to both fill metal containers with water and also cut some of those containers' metal chains in the same puzzle. You would think that means that you have to cut the chain with a fast water slice, since that's also straight up been done in the show before. Nope, you use air here. It's the only time you do that. The amount of times the game teaches you one thing with the tutorials, and then later in that level actually wants you to do something completely different in the same situation, it's, it's bafflingly poorly designed. 
Out of the entire Avatar game series, even up through now, this has by far the best cutscenes, and it actually has the most uses for bending as puzzle elements out of every 3D game as well. And yet, since the puzzles actively fight the rules the game itself has already set up for you, the cutscenes are the only thing Into the Inferno has going for it, which is just stellar since they also completely butchered the story, rendering those cutscenes also kinda worthless. Actually, I lied, the only other thing this game has going for it is that it lets you air glide in this pilot wings styled bonus area. I don't know why, but it's the most fun part of the game, and it's one of the only times that there's an official Avatar game that actually lets you air glide, so I'll, I'll take it. There's nothing more symbolic of how little this game seems to care than the final cutscene where Aang defeats Ozai. This epic series conclusion, played to underwhelming music, and then rushed along so quickly just to get you to the credits that they superimpose Ozai into a jail cell to skip the entire rest of the ending. In incredible. Awful. Both. Before we move on to the last Airbender movie tie-in games, it's time for the Rapid Fire Round. See, although there are 16 distinct games slash versions of games that I'm covering here, I did say that we were going to dig through all of the Avatar games, and there are another 40-something that I'm not going to count as proper games. For example, because this series existed in the mid-2000s, there's, of course, an Avatar plug-and-play console. Some of these games I've played, some of these I haven't, I'll let you guess which ones are which, and many of them straight up don't exist anymore because they were Flash games. And before you ask, no, I'm not counting any of the Nickelodeon crossover games here just to pad the numbers. First, there are two full boxed PC games, I don't think I'd call them full games myself, called Avatar The Last Airbender Bobble Battles and Avatar The Last Airbender The Path of Zuko, which both use the same chibi art style featured in the DS version of the Season 3 game. The former is a sort of strategy game, obviously not a very complex one, and the other is a super basic Zelda clone that uses only your computer's mouse. There are also a few non-video games that are more worth mentioning than the list that's about to come, so I'm going to mention them, such as the Avatar Legends tabletop RPG that released in 2023 after a successful Kickstarter back in 2021. There's Fire Nation Rising, a co-op card game that released in 2022, and that's in addition to two other trading card games made over the years, both of which are actually, weirdly enough, crossover card games with other media, so I guess I shouldn't mention them if I'm abiding by my own rules, but, but I'm still gonna mention them because the original card game from 2006 utilized Upper Deck's short-lived Quick Strike concept, which only made it to 3 IP before being canned. So if you ever wanted to play a trading card game that's for some reason 90 minutes long where you can combine Avatar and Pirates of the Caribbean, boy do I have the discontinued game for you. And there are no fewer than three Avatar board games currently, and that's excluding Avatar Monopoly. Okay, now for the true rapid fire round, also known as the My Editor Hates Me section of this video. The rest of these have all appeared on Nickelodeon websites over the years. I'm not going to explain what every single one of these are since very few of them even have footage that exists anymore. There's Aang On, there's the UK exclusive Amulet Quest which uses the Avatar The Legend of Aang branding instead of The Last Airbender, there's Avatar Arena where you could create your own bender, there's Ashes in the Air, Autumn Twilight, Barge Barrage, Bending Battle, Black Sun Siege, Boiling Rock Rescue, Clash of the Benders, Dangerous Dash, Dark Into Light, Earth Healers, Elemental Escape, Escape the Spirit World, sometimes called Escape from the Spirit World, not to be confused with another game also named Escape from the Spirit World which is a completely canon storyline that addresses what Aang did in the Spirit World in between seasons 2 and 3 after he got hit by Azula's lightning, there's Fortress Fight and Fortress Fight 2, Four Nations Tournament, Hangman, it's it's just Hangman, there was a full MMO called Avatar Legends of the Arena, there's Masters of the Elements, I'm sorry, Master of the Elements, I said it wrong, there's Nicktoon's Avatar State Brain Blitz, there's just Pi Show, but not actually the real Pi Show, the Avatar version of Pi Show, there was an online Avatar Quest Creator game where you could create quests and share them online, I'm not sure how that would have worked, but this particular screenshot gives me Age of Empires vibes, so I'm kind of into it, there are a couple Korra games called Republic City Rescue and Republic City Run, there's Rise of the Avatar, Rise of the Phoenix King, Sozin's Echo, The Last Stand, Treetop Trouble, sorry in advance to any Spyro fans out there, there's a game titled Trial of Serpents Pass, another one called Welcome to Republic City, which is once again a Korra game, there's Avatar Word Search, and last but not least, there's Zuko's Dragon Fight, which takes place during Korra's third season. I need to breathe. I would not be shocked at all if there are another 50 even deeper cuts out there either, this is simply what I was able to find. On to the 2010 movie game, we can't put this one off for too much longer. Now, I'm not going to give the movie's backstory to the same extent that I did the show, I, I have to draw a line at some point. The short of it is that M. Night Shyamalan butchered Avatar's first season so badly with this movie that he couldn't even get Aang's name pronounced properly. 
My name is Ong. The show's creators were pretty much snubbed the entire way despite initially being involved in the process, and they've since thrown some very unsubtle shade at other facets of the movie's lack of direction. Shyamalan, meanwhile, blamed the movie's quality on the source material being too long. The movie was an absolute dumpster fire, not just an insult to the series, but an insult to anybody who enjoys movies, period. Massive chunks of season one's plot are just relegated to exposition. The movie kind of focuses more on Zuko than Aang. There's, there's nothing redeemable about this film. Well, except maybe the DS game. This was one of Halfbrick's final titles before it went fully into its Fruit Ninja era. Like with Into the Inferno, this game does a far better job at telling the story at hand than the Wii game did, even if in this case it's telling a flawed version of Avatar's first season. I mean, for one, Sokka and Katara are actually here at all. They, they essentially don't exist in the Wii game, where the entire story is Zuko telling you his side of the story, then telling Aang's side of the story, and then explaining anything and everything else in the pre-level cutscenes in order to leap over the entire rest of the plot. The Wii game even gets basic story beats out of order, and I don't mean out of order with the show, I mean with the movie too. Halfbrick, though, they created a pretty decent adventure game here, I, I have to admit. Once again, I always give bonus points for anything that uses the air glider whatsoever, because man, the air glider is just a huge missed opportunity with these games most of the time. Here, there are both some platforming sections that require the air glider and an obstacle course during a lengthy flashback level that puts Aang back in the air temple before he was frozen for a century. The Zuko sections are more platforming focused, with loads of wall climbing and whatnot, where Aang's sections tend to lean a bit more puzzly. In fact, by the end, Aang's even waterbending, moving bowls of water from one container to another to progress just like in Half Brick's other games. It's kind of neat to see at least one Avatar game series keep to its DNA without butchering it or changing it up as time goes on. There are even side quests here, which will reward you with experience points that you can use to level up Aang or Zuko's movesets. The combat is basic touchscreen tap-based fighting, but the only thing I care about here is that there's an upgrade that lets you instantly defeat enemies who are knocked down. This game's even out here solving problems that the non-Halfbrick versions had. I, I gotta respect it. It's still a game that's completely hamstrung by the bad source material, but you can tell they really tried their damnedest to make something worthwhile. I also want to shout out some smaller touches, like some pretty solid tunes in the background that gave me some JRPG vibes. The dynamic camera pans stood out to me compared to other DS games I can recall from this era. It was honestly pretty cool. Plus, Oppa looks depressed, and I can relate to that. Now, the Wii game, the only thing I can say about it that isn't a negative is that it was composed by Mick Gordon, of all people. That doesn't mean I remember a single track from this game, but, but hey. I'm not kidding when I say the entire story is relayed to you in the pre-level cutscenes by Zuko, to the point that Katara and Sokka straight up aren't in the game pretty much whatsoever. Even story beats like Aang surrendering to Zuko's troops to spare the Water Tribe, that's all explained with a still image and Zuko talking over it. The single least effective way to highlight Zuko's stellar character arc is to tell this entire story from his perspective, the perspective of the bad guy for at least the first season slash would-be first movie, doubly so if you're just gonna make the character whiny. Zuko also gets a 6-4 advantage in playable levels, since there's an extended blue spirit level in level 3. Great, great pacing. But it's not just that it tells the badly told story just as badly, if not worse, compared to the movie, because the game is a travesty against game design in a bunch of ways, from THQ Australia once again excluding the ability to dodge or block, so your best way to avoid attacks is to just jump like an idiot. Or there's your powered up rage move state not having even startup armor, so you can get knocked down while activating it, which wastes precious time. The game pretty consistently uses these same levels or visual styles of levels twice in a row, such as Zuko fighting traitors on his ship in level 1, followed by Aang escaping that ship in level 2, and then repeating this in levels 3 and 4, where Zuko's entire level is saving Aang, and Aang's level after that is escaping the level that you essentially just did moments ago. That first tutorial level, by the way, it's like 30 minutes long, and it ends in a boss who throws explosive barrels at you, barrels that are filled with health pickups. Great. The game even has the audacity to feature in-game achievements as if you would dare to actually care when playing the game. Mind you, this only came out on the Wii, so those achievements cannot transfer anywhere. The game's inexplicably full of on-rails first-person shooter set pieces also, so hope you like that. Enemies have too much health even though I went out of my way to play on easy because if they weren't gonna try, why should I? Not that combat is difficult, mind you, it's mostly pressing one button and then occasionally ending with a motion control QTE. 
I, I guess it's cool that armor pieces break off and fly away as you deal damage, but, but I'm not gonna stretch for things to say, the game already finds a way to never shut up as it is. This was the only one that I straight up stopped playing, that I did not finish, and it makes me sad to report that this wasn't the worst Avatar game I've played, it did somehow get worse later with one that I, I, I did finish. Oh, sorry, the worst the Avatar game. That's how it's pronounced here, I forgot. And now it's time for some more tonal whiplash, because we get to go from one of the worst Avatar slash Avatar games to ever be made, to maybe my favorite overall, Platinum Games' Legend of Korra. This was a budget title that I think got a really bad rap when it first came out back in 2014. Many of the criticisms are that it's short and repetitive, both of which are definitely true, don't get me wrong, but a four-ish hour platinum game that costs only 15 bucks and is meant to be replayed a few times over to really get the full meat of it, looking back now, hell yeah, I will absolutely take that, especially now when the game costs pretty much nothing at all. By that I mean it does cost nothing because Activision delisted it when the license expired so you can't get it anymore. Yeah, this was the first Avatar game in the post-THQ era. If you want some more info on THQ's downfall, I just made a video about it actually, so go check that out when you're done here. But Activision picked up the license for this one, as well as the other Korra game, more on that one in a bit. First, let's talk about Korra's rocky history. For those unfamiliar with Korra's show and the constant issues it had with Nickelodeon, take everything I've talked about with Aang's series and multiply it tenfold. Originally greenlit as a 12-episode miniseries showing the Avatar world 70 years after the first series, and of course featuring a new Avatar to highlight this changing, industrial revolution-inspired post-war world, Korra was announced at 2010's Comic-Con, only a month after the last Airbender movie had released and bombed. By that measure, it was clear that Nickelodeon realized the movie's inherent flaws weren't with the source material or the series' popularity, and that it should continue to try to build the franchise up further. Also, fun sidebar, the show was briefly, for some reason, planned to be called The Last Airbender Legend of Korra, despite there being more airbenders now. Now, although it started as a one-season miniseries, Nickelodeon quickly asked for another season after Korra became the US's most viewed animated show per episode in the year 2012. Part of the show's impressive ratings is simply that the show's target audience had expanded. Korra would aim to be a slightly more mature show than even the first Avatar series, that would reach the now-grown fans of Aang's story as well as Nick's usual younger viewers. This was by design, and Nickelodeon explicitly targeted those older viewers. Mind you, Korra's first season still aired on Saturday mornings. You know who's not waking up on Saturday mornings to watch cartoons? 16-year-olds. The fact that this was doing numbers comparable to Aang's peak despite Nickelodeon falling from being the top basic cable network in 2008 to, well, far lower than number one four years later thanks to the at-the-time slowly accelerating cord cutting, it was more than anybody could have hoped. The ratings took a dip in Season 2, which aired 15 months later in the fall of 2013, in the Friday night death slot. Nickelodeon apparently thought the best way to follow up one of its most successful new shows in years was to put it in an even worse time slot for the main demographic they were targeting, but it was still successful in spite of that. So Nick once again asked for two more seasons after season 2's story had already been set in stone and production was mostly complete, which led to a bit of a disjointed feel in the storytelling series-wide since, you know, they had to create both of the first two seasons as if it was going to be the definitive ending of the story. This ended up leading to a messy production, I mean duh, but messy enough that season 2's final episodes were being finished while work on season 3 and even 4's episodes was actively underway. At one point, the studio was working on 30 episodes of this 50 two episode show simultaneously, and it meant that apparently the final touch-up work for the finale was still going on the very day the finale was set to air. This constant shift in production scope also meant that the original animation studio that handled the first season briefly left due to a work overlap, prioritizing the other show it had signed on to do first, the Boondocks of all things, because it was a much easier job to do than the animation-intensive Avatar. So, Season 2 ended up looking a bit sloppier due to two different studios working on different episodes. But we're not done yet, it only got messier from here, as parts of Season 3 were accidentally leaked online a few different times, and with Nickelodeon's ratings in general continuing to decline, Korra's included, the final chunk of Season 3 and the entirety of Season 4 were all released on Nickelodeon's website to burn through the episodes and get the series over with. The core of video games both share a plot which takes place during the gap between Seasons 2 and 3 in the timeline, although they released a few weeks into Season 4, airing. Okay, we're caught up again. So the Platinum game is the most Platinum game to ever Platinum 
game. It's a beat-em-up game with a number of combat encounters per chapter, each of which gives you a score and a ranking based on how well you perform. In between levels, you can purchase a bunch of equipable modifiers that do things like have your health but double your damage output, or have your damage output but double your experience, stuff like that. There's not a huge enemy variety either, and sadly the game suffers from the decision to take all four of Korra's elements away early on, forcing you to unlock them at set points in the story. Also, there's a weird Endless Runner where Korra rides on her polar bear dog Naga because Endless Runners were all the rage back then. Keep the Endless Runner thing in mind, because somehow that's coming back too. A lot of this may not sound compelling, but in motion, it's the closest that an Avatar game has come to showing the power of each element. Attacks are weighty and satisfying. You can swap on the fly between the elements you've unlocked to do some combo chains, and each style has its own experience bar to further unlock new abilities and options as you go through the game's eight chapters. The game actually starts out a bit on the hard, almost unfair side, quickly throwing you into fights against three sub-bosses at once, each one using a different element to further make things a pain to manage. It's kinda hard to focus on the slow, burly earthbender when there's a waterbender shooting icicles at you every few seconds. Crucially though, this is the kind of game that gets better on replay, since A, there are some treasure chests hidden in each level behind certain elemental doors so that you have a reason to come back later, and B, you are straight up not going to max out all of your elemental stats in one playthrough because the point is to struggle through it once and then come back a second time as a powerhouse. I don't necessarily agree with this as a design decision, I think it's a bad decision frankly, but it does work here if you can get over the fact that the middle of the game puts you against the same repetitive few enemy types over and over again. It forces you to learn each element slowly so that you can get a really good feel of firebending's super fast-paced melee attacks, waterbending's ranged supremacy, earthbending's slow but incredibly powerful bulky moves, and airbending's... Well, actually, airbending is honestly just kind of overpowered in this game. It's fast like firebending, strong like earthbending, and it has waterbending's range. Not quite sure why that's the case here, but by that point, you know what, I'm already hooked into the combat loop, so I'm kind of cool with it. It's not even close to a flawless game. The villain, who I think is technically canon because he was created by the show's creators, is just kind of a spooky wizard, and the game spends most of its runtime meandering about in Republic City, the neutral zone built by Aang and Zuko after the first show's ending. Although I like Republic City a ton, both in the show and the game, both of them run into the same issue where just a bit more variety would have really gone a long way. Especially in the game, since the seventh of, again, only eight chapters is a filler chapter retreading all the areas you've already visited. It almost feels like Platinum was given a time quota that they were tasked with hitting rather than a content quota. But I do once again have to give a bit of credit, because retreading those areas with all of those elements fully unlocked during that seventh chapter, it shows you why you struggled earlier, and it gets you to appreciate just how strong Korra is as the Avatar. By the time you reach the end of the game and get to use the Avatar state, you're just in pure god mode, and it's one of the few times you can actually play in the Avatar state. It's more than worth the wait. This game... It just feels fun to play, and that bypasses all of the other little issues that add up. I don't blame anybody who maybe never went back to New Game Plus, but that's definitely where the game lives and breathes. Oh, and also there's a pro-bending minigame featuring the sport right out of Korra's show, which I really appreciate. It's definitely not Platinum's best game, but for a quick in-and-out project, they made sure the parts that mattered felt the most satisfying. It's just a shame that the most enjoyable way to mess around with the four elements in an Avatar game is in a game that no longer exists, but at the very least, you still can find the PC files out there if you search for them. Now, the other Korra game, that one still exists, and honestly, that's probably kind of a shame too. This 3DS Korra game was developed by Webfoot Technologies, a company whose only notable contribution since then was teasing a Dragon Ball Z Legacy of Goku 4 for a few years to capitalize on the cult following the first three Legacy of Goku's games had when they made them way back on the Game Boy Advance. This fourth game, very clearly, was never in production, and if that's not a good enough indicator of how this Korra game turned out, Webfoot most recently spent its time peddling NFTs. Uh, sorry, NTFs. Color me surprised when I found out that the 3DS Korra game was a Fire Emblem clone. Yeah, instead of a weapon triangle, there's a bending square with super effective attacks dealing direct damage to a character's health. Otherwise, if you're not dealing super effective damage, you first have to attack a few times just to whittle down the enemy's shield stat. The greatest strength this version of Korra's game has is that it actually features the rest of Korra's cast, where the Platinum Korra title really only features Korra outside of a couple cutscenes where maybe one or two other characters from the show appear. Here, by the end, you've got Korra, Mako, Bolin, Lin Bei Fong, Aang and Katara's son Tenzin, and their daughter Kaya. 
Each has their own ability set, with Lin, for example, utilizing her metal bending whip attacks that she uses as the city's police chief. This version also does a bit of a better job of telling the story intended for these games compared to the Platinum one. It's still nothing special, just spooky wizard man taking out a thousand year grudge on the Avatar, but there's a bit more texture here thanks to the, well, text boxes. There is some wonkiness to the controls, with tutorials for some reason using the touchscreen, but the actual gameplay not using the touchscreen, as well as some other general UI issues like having to equip attacks before you can use them, which for AoE attacks, breaks things. That's because there's some sort of bug with AoE attacks where to unequip them you have to prepare to attack, then cancel that attack action to be able to use anything else or an item. Oh, and the cutscenes are, uh... Yeah. The real backbreaking issues with this game are that A, each character can only have four items on them, which gets a bit rough later, B, you often have to choose which of two moves or permanent stat buffs to add to a character's moveset when they level up, except most of the time, the moves that require more chi in this game actually deal less damage than your starter moves, and there's no way to ever go back and get the other move or stat that you turn down. And see, the idea of a bending rock-paper-scissors system is cool until there are non-bending enemies that also do extra damage to Earthbenders specifically, and when Korra loses all of her bending immediately in this game too. It means that the characters that should be the strongest, your tanks, are the easiest to pick off, and Korra is the weakest character for most of the game. Now let's revisit problem B here, because as Korra, when you level up, you have to think ahead, which you're not going to know any better to do this, and you have to pick bending moves that you can't yet use, even if it doesn't seem like it makes sense at the time, because once you unlock each element, you don't actually get a move that comes with it free of charge. So if you don't grab one of each elemental move right away the first chance you get, you might never get another of that element with future level ups. Oh, and the only firebender besides Korra, it's the slowest person on your squad, which is just great when a plurality of enemies are weak to fire. If it sounds like there are a lot of backbreaking things, yeah. It starts out okay, but very quickly the game throws an overwhelming amount of enemies at you, which turns into a decision of grind out every single fight and waste 20 extra minutes on basic combat that just doesn't feel fun, or go to the exit and risk being underpowered. Don't let the rankings at the end of levels fool you either, by the way. You cannot replay past levels once you finish them unless you start a brand new file. Color me surprised when I beat the game and found that out when the game more or less says earlier to come back later to be able to do this particular level better. The level layouts are just uninspired, with no positional attack bonuses like you might expect from a tile-based strategy game. There are some bending element pads that show up that give you a temporary buff to one particular stat, but they're not super helpful. Then there's Korra being limited the entire game, which means that there's little by way of replayability despite the game throwing those rankings and bonus objectives in there, and here's the real kicker. The Spirit World section of the game is maybe the worst thing that I can recall seeing in this style of tactics game ever. See, Korra doesn't remember how to spirit bend to help free these tortured spirits, so for the entire second half of the game, any spirit enemies you defeat will respawn within three turns. This gimmick first appears in a level where you're tasked with defeating seven spirit enemies with your six characters in that three turn span, when the game lays the enemies out in such a way that the guys that are super effective against any one of your characters are the first ones that each character will reach. So the firebender has to take three turns to get across this very small map, by which point the fire spirits have already killed your earthbenders, all while Aang's two kids are struggling to fight a couple other enemies since you have to be super effective against an enemy, or else you'll only deal 10 damage after spending one to three turns taking down their shields first. All the while, Korra is just kinda there. Okay. Oh, oh, and the kicker, by the way, these enemies are only level 3, like 10 levels lower than you despite one-shotting most of your party, so they only give you a couple experience points upon defeat. It's a mercy that this game, despite all this, is only 6 hours long in total. Any further, and I just, I, I would have probably stopped because it is not really fun as a Fire Emblem game, and it's just, it wouldn't be worth the time. It already wasn't worth the time I spent, but now I'm one of the four people ever to have actually talked about this game online, so you're welcome. After these two 2014 Korra games, we had nearly a decade gap without any Avatar media outside of official graphic novels to bring us up to about the present day. 
But first, one small detour because we do have something unofficial to hit on first. See, there are others like me out there in the world, suffering through some of these games and wondering how we've somehow not gotten more than one or two decent Avatar games this entire time. A fellow YouTube creator named Elka Gaming went one step beyond just wondering that and saying, I'll make a video about that one day in like 2016, as shortly after the PlayStation 4 game Dreams entered its early access in April 2019, he endeavored to create his own Avatar game with Blackjack and Hookers. Starting with little to no game design knowledge, which by the way shows just how insane Dreams is, credit to Media Molecule as well here, Elka has spent the better part of four years creating a fan game now called Four Seasons. And I'm not kidding when I say even the early demos are better than most of the official Avatar games we've talked about today. Sadly, although he and a small group of volunteers have seemingly put together the bones for a very solid game, only two basic demos are available, with most of their work still inaccessible to the regular player. One of those demos at the time of recording is only a few months old, and has a fully explorable island with some hidden treasure chests with, of course, cabbages, the ability to air glide, just a little toy box of sorts to show you the mechanics. If you go back to the older version of the demo, you have access to the first few areas of the last Airbender story, starting in Katara and Sokka's village, visiting Aang's old air temple, and a partially explorable Kyoshi Island. Only the first of these three has proper quests, but the scope of each is beyond impressive for a fan project. There are fully explorable interiors with massive caves or the crashed Fire Nation ship. The game has its own triggers that lead to bonus minigames like penguin sledding, or that lead to Zuko's ship approaching the Water Tribe village just like in the show. The penguin sledding is also better than the 2023 official Avatar Games version too, we'll get there in a sec. And these areas are explorable both during the day and at night, as is the sample overworld where you can fly around with Appa and see the entire planet's map, all the way down to things like the lights of moving trains in Ba Sing Se below you. It's really impressive. Again, there's not much to these demos besides a sometimes excessively large world, and I would fully anticipate knowing Dreams' limitations that there would never be much by way of enemies. But in the same breath, I never knew that in Dreams you could chain together different projects directly to bypass those size limits, so maybe the sky would have been the limit. Problem is, Dreams just ended its support earlier this year, which further limited those size caps, and also meant the plans to allow developers to port their Dreams games off-platform onto PC, among other features, well, Four Seasons lifespan is now more limited than it already was. And it's a shame, because there was so much work that's clearly gone in beyond what we've been able to play here on this side of the screen. Dozens of whole areas that the dude has livestreamed himself creating bit by bit that hopefully will one day get to see the light of day before Sony inevitably sunsets the Dream servers entirely in like five to ten years. Even in the face of the inevitable sunset of Dreams, Elka Gaming still posting online pretty much every day with progress updates at the time of recording, which means that this fan game that's nearing its fifth anniversary that cannot possibly make a dollar due to, you know, licensing, has outlived the next game we're going to talk about. I had to change this entire part of my script because a week after I recorded gameplay of the mobile gacha RPG Avatar Generations, the publishers at, get this, Crystal Dynamics IDOS announced that the game was shutting down on December 2nd, 2023. This game launched at the end of January, after a country-specific beta release in Canada, Sweden, and South Africa starting in August 2022. Around August of this year, and this was a piece of info that I had missed in my initial research pass, most of the development studio for Generations was laid off, which explains why the game stopped getting any real updates after that point. But let's go back a bit. What is Avatar Generations? The promise of this game was to tell the entire story of multiple avatars, including Aang and, heavy air quotes, eventually Korra, along with others like Kyoshi, whose stories haven't been fully explored yet, all wrapped up in a frequently updated gacha RPG package that even the game's five fans would admit were overpriced even by gacha standards. I'm not going to pretend that I cared enough to dive into the nuance of the combat, because as far as the story stuff goes, it's pretty easy to brute force the encounters, and outside of the story, there really didn't seem to be much to do. Since the game is now dead, all you need to know is that it's your bog-standard turn-based RPG gameplay with a couple wrinkles that were thrown in. There were daily challenges and endless amount of items to assault your senses that each often act as their own upgrade currency, multiple actual currencies because this wouldn't be a live service game without multiple currencies, and pulls, 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 pulls. 
After playing about, I don't know, an hour or so, I had in my notes that this game would be dead in about six months. If you told me that exactly six days after I wrote that, they'd be announcing its shutdown, well, actually, I would 100% believe you. I'm gonna hope one of you out there is weird enough to verbally ask, why is that? Because I'm gonna answer it. Well, in part because it hadn't gotten any content updates in at least five months. See, Aang's story immediately throws some filler your way, which is incredible, so I went to check Korra's story, only to find out that Korra had never been introduced, but that Kyoshi was. Kyoshi's story lasts maybe 40 minutes before it just stops, waiting for an update that will now never come. Her story was, frankly, kind of insulting before that anyway. It turns out that it's apparently canon from a 2019 book that Kiyoshi's friend Yoon was assumed to be the Avatar, not her. And while I'm assuming the book handles that idea a bit more tactfully with more than, I don't know, 20 minutes of content in the book, I'm, I'm going to hope, it'd be a really weird book if it didn't have more than 20 minutes of content, the game presents Kiyoshi here as a servant to Yoon, with everybody else in the town essentially talking down to her. It kind of rubbed me the wrong way, especially since after fighting some pirates, getting insulted by Yoon's rude trainer, and doing some other filler errands, the story just pauses, with the game not even telling you that there's no way to progress until the next update. So all we got with Kiyoshi's campaign was a taste test, a sampler that involved this mythically strong character that lives to be over 200 years old, getting verbally slapped around and acting meekly. What a joke. This was, mind you, one of the first pieces of media properly shown in the Avatar Studios era, after Paramount brought back the series' creators in 2021 to helm this multimedia empire that would hopefully help prop up Paramount+. Plus. Almost everything else was set four years down the road, such as the post-Last Airbender Aang and Crew as Adults theatrical movie and an Earthbending Avatar show both in 2025, a 2026 Zuko film, and two spin-off shows in 2026 and 2027, but this game, the next game, and the currently untitled mobile strategy game that's set to come out in 2024, these were the best we got outside of merch, books, merch, comics, and merch, 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 merch. For the first two games in this new era to be worse than the prior era, well, it doesn't necessarily bode poorly for the entire rest of Avatar. I would say the rest of the Avatar Studio stuff rests more on whether Paramount Plus even makes it to 2026 and stops losing money. But it's not a good omen when in the same breath other Nickelodeon series are getting faithful revivals and solid sequels to those revivals. That mobile strategy game, by the way, it's being phrased as if it's a city builder, so I'm guessing Clash of Clans. Don't get your hopes up that they won't strike out a third time. Back to Avatar Generations for a sec, the only good thing I can say about this game is that the music is actually really strong, one of the few Avatar games with more than minimum effort put into the soundtrack. A good chunk of this video's background music is sampled from this game, because you have no idea how barren the game series is otherwise in terms of soundtrack. And that includes the next game, Avatar The Last Airbender Quest for Balance. Published by the fittingly named Game Mill in September 2023, Quest for Balance is the worst kind of licensed game. A disclosure reminder from earlier, Game Mill sent me a review copy of the game about a day or two before launch, because I was hoping against hope that I could end this video on a positive note. I... I, I, I cannot. You've possibly already heard some of the problems with this game from the overwhelmingly negative reviews on Steam or other creators out there, so let me go another route first and highlight that this game does not have a Metacritic score because only two press outlets have covered it. Not even GameSpot, who mind you is owned by the same company as Metacritic, was tasked with reviewing this game. Open Critic isn't any different. This game doesn't have a proper score there either, putting it in the, and I quote, negative one-th percentile of games. Nobody wanted to touch Quest for Balance, and there's a reason. This game isn't just bad, it's boring, dreadfully boring, the kind of game that cannot appeal to either Avatar audience. Longtime older fans can accept that yes, they're going to be playing children's games most of the time, hi, hello, but not something this brain dead. Meanwhile, kids would already have to be huge fans of Avatar to get anything out of this because this story butchers The Last Airbender. See, Quest for Balance is a frame story, a post-TLA retelling of the events of the show by Iroh and the other White Lotus members. They're sharing the tale with a playwright who is looking to put together a masterpiece of a show to celebrate Zuko's coronation as the Fire Lord. So what do they do with this frame story? They take after the last Airbender movie game, skipping over entire key episodes in order to rush things along and ensure that pretty much none of the game that you get to play is a substantive part of the Avatar story. 
Even throughout each of this game's 18 chapters, not just the beginning and end, but during them, the game will just throw a text box up in between sections to have one of the old men tell you the story that occurred in between points A and B. And the worst part? This is preferable to the alternative, because only two voice actors return from the show, and none of the rest of them give any sort of convincing performance whatsoever. One of the returning voice actors is the prolific D. Bradley Baker, who mainly voiced a bunch of the animals such as Appa and Momo. His spot in the credits very well may be archival clips just reused for the game. The other returning voice is James C., voice of the Cabbage Salesman. Except he doesn't voice the Cabbage Man in this game, somebody else does. Instead, he stands in for Fire Lord Ozai. The OG Cabbage Salesman is the villain. They, they couldn't even get that right. Now, of course, a lot of the voice roles would naturally be replaced over time, especially since, for example, Aang's original voice actor is no longer a child, so yeah, he's not going to be able to do a young Aang voice anymore. The issue here is that the voice acting is pretty awful across the board, and the game's visual fidelity is also like, let's be generous and say PlayStation 3 level, so any attempt at making actual cutscenes the few times they do just takes valuable resources away from things like making the game, and low-budget Peruvian developer Bam Tang Games needed all the help it could get on that front to begin with. I promise you, the last thing I would want in this game is to hear any more of the poor kid voicing Aang screeching in my ears thanks to poor voice direction. Last thing I'll say about the voices before I move on, I've got a conspiracy theory that this game may have snuck in a Canadian media grant to help subsidize some of its budget. It first caught my eye when I saw that Zuko's replacement voice was in a significant number of Canadian animated projects in recent years, including the Ratchet & Clank movie as Brax, which I know for a fact took Canadian grant money. A decent number of the cast is from Canada, which is one of the smaller requirements for Canadian funding. I, I would have looked into this further, but even saying these last two sentences means that I've looked into it more than anybody else in gaming press, so I'll hang my hat on that because not a soul gives a damn. So anyway, this stupid f***ing game, which was, according to the developer, intended to reach younger kids unfamiliar with the show's story, and yet tells that story the worst out of any Avatar game yet, it is split into 18 chapters, 6 per book. After about a chapter or two, this is a fully cooperative game, which is at least a nod in its favor, and somehow, this is maybe the longest Avatar game of them all? Clocking in at 9 hours? They really wanted you to feel like you got your $50 out of this one. The base upon which Quest for Balance is derived is the LEGO Star Wars franchise, so imagine this as a dog shit imitation of that. Each chapter tends to have a little hub, a number of side quests, a couple areas that will require you to come back with a specific character or bender to get the secrets. Take all of that and just imagine it done at the most surface level possible and poorly. For example, puzzles in this game are almost always block puzzles, and if they're not, or even sometimes when they are, they require you to grab a torch and carry it from one side of a room to the other without it being doused by water. Even later when you're a firebender and could just light the torch at the other side with your firebending, these exist. I meant a couple literally when I mentioned secret areas, by the way. It's one or two per level at most, usually one. Like with the LEGO games, there's a wide cast of characters to play as, and by that I mean nine. Some of them, like Suki the Kyoshi Warrior or the Blue Spirit, they show up once in Book 1 and then disappear for either the entire rest of the game or almost the entire rest of the game. So be careful not to spend your limited pie shell upgrade tokens on those characters' skill trees because you are just wasting that experience. Also, all these characters play just about the same anyway. It's all mindless button mashing combos. You don't really have to worry about dodging because enemy attacks don't do much, and it's clear that the combat is tertiary in this one, behind trying to figure out how many block puzzles you can get into a game before it reaches critical mass, and making a game that's also a sleep medication. The only unique aspect to each character tends to be their specialty moves. Katara has a healing move, Sokka's is a damage buff war cry, etc. I shouldn't even really have called it comboing either. It's slow and heavy three-hit punch combos. You can't chain anything together. The side quests I mentioned a moment ago are also bad. What a... what a shock. They're mostly fetch quests. Oftentimes, they don't let you grab the items that clearly stand out in their environments as fetch quest items until you first get the fetch quest, which then forces you to backtrack and fetch the item. Sometimes the quests want you to do the tasks in question in a specific order, like giving lunch snacks to different villagers. And that lunch quest is one of the few where they actually tell you which order to do them in. Most of the time, it's just run around the level until you find the quest trigger, go back, and repeat. Even some of the main missions do this too. It's... it's great. 
The rewards for all these side quests are just money and pie show tiles, and neither are all that worth it when the upgrades are just combat tweaks and the money is really only worth using on the eight bending scrolls that you can unlock for each element, which also don't really matter all that much. Plus, you can just keep reloading the game and destroy the Cabbage Salesman's cart over and over again and get infinite money. I Actually, fun fact, before this game was patched, the economy was broken, not even counting the Cabbage Salesman. You could buy the Moon Peach Health Regen item, for example, for 50 coins, and then sell it back for 100 coins. Yeah. Alright, let me just run through the list of oddities really quickly here. There is no drop shadow in this game, despite the game frequently wanting to pretend that it's a platformer. I found a dude sweeping the streets, but his broom didn't load in. Ten minutes after that, I had to reload the game entirely because I physically couldn't destroy one of the two flaming carts that I needed to destroy to progress. At first, because it wanted me to destroy the other one first and didn't tell me that I couldn't destroy the second one until I destroyed the first one when it doesn't- there's no- it doesn't f***ing tell you that. And then after that, simply because it didn't register the other one as a destructible item anyway, so I had to reload. They skipped the entire first Omashu episode in a text box, which is probably a blessing since that level would run like absolute shit. I know this because there's a Season 2 Omashu episode that's already in the game, and that area runs like shit. For some reason, Aang and Sokka have GTA San Andreas gangster NPC hand movements during cutscenes, that just kind of threw me off. And speaking of that, the ally AI in this game is horrendous. Sometimes they'll get stuck on basic geography, or they'll forget to jump up some stairs, and you'll just have to hope that sometime in the next five minutes they respawn next to you. Why, you ask? Well, good question. Remember in the first Avatar game when I mentioned that it doesn't tell you which D-pad direction corresponds to which character that you need to switch to? Well, this game is the amalgam of every Avatar game since, so this does that too, but worse somehow. And if you pick the wrong character to swap to and it's somebody far away from you, even though you've been waiting for them to respawn next to you and they just won't respawn next to you, if you swap over to that character by accident, Quest for Balance will immediately respawn all of the allies to back to where you now are. So then, you have to slowly jog back to where you just were to swap to the character you needed to activate a contextual switch. Now remember when I said to remember the Endless Runner stuff from the Korra game? Well, those are here too, and uh, frequently. Penguin sledding in Chapter 1, Elephant Koi riding in Chapter 2. These, like every Temple Run kind of game, are always locked to three lanes, frequently with enemy attacks and obstacles flying in, which sometimes have disjointed hitboxes here so that you can get hit even when you're following the trails of coins meant to tell you which way to safely go. This sort of runner minigame was already out of style in 2014, so to see them do it in 2023 is maybe the most confusing part of this entire game, and this one has the added one-two punch of a four-year-old unofficial fan game demo having better penguin sledding than the official game. Alright, back to my list here, what's next? Outside of a handful of cutscenes, anything in-game is the lowest effort possible, all the way down to a lack of lip-flap animations, just like in The Burning Earth. Boss fights are the most basic, cookie-cutter garbage imaginable, like Zuko doing the same charge attack three times before standing still and being open to an attack. And by the way, you do this same boss fight twice in the first three to four chapters. Aang, in this version of the story, masters waterbending by beating up some waterbenders. Yeah, just to reiterate how the game chooses some of the least important story moments to highlight as actual facets of gameplay, Chapter 5 of the six chapters in Book 1 starts with you collecting frozen toads to cure Katara and Sokka, before Chapter 6 skips the entire rest of Season 1 and goes to the ending. They then skip most of Season 2 as well, and it's at this point that I realize the computer-controlled allies do a fraction of the damage that you would do as that character if you were controlling them in that exact moment, so that's just stellar. There's a whole item system in this game, certain items are general boosts and certain ones are specific to certain types of benders, except you never need a single goddamn one of them. The only time I used one was a speed boost during a very particularly time-crunchy puzzle, where I had to once again move a torch through some spinning water cannons with disjointed hitboxes that will knock you down and put out the fire even well outside of the water spray, only to find out afterwards, and the game just actually says this, that this puzzle was entirely filler, but mandatory. Whew, I love it. This puzzle is one of what feels like two or three such puzzles every chapter, where the game turns basic plot points from the show into a deus ex machina of sorts. Remember that one-off guru that tries to help Aang's chi late in the series? No, you probably don't. Well, in Quest for Balance, every time anything is supposed to happen in the story, we do a Breath of the Wild shrine knockoff, with each one being either a block puzzle or a move the stone wheel from point A to B puzzle. Remember that time the gang found the secret of Lake Laogai by moving blocks first and then suddenly realizing the answer because some blue guy told him? No, me neither. 
Just look at this fucking shaking static image here. When this game was first leaked as a Breath of the Wild inspired Avatar game and it gave us all hope for a brief moment, this was not what we anticipated they meant. It took me until like five hours in when one of the text box cutscenes talks about this guru for me to realize that this wasn't just meant to be a generic monk to fully cop from Zelda because this guy is such a forgettable character when you see him as a goddamn blue JPEG. Oh, and by the way, they skip most of Chapter 3, too. They don't even try to explain what happens this time around, though. Aang goes from being shot by Azula to totally fine in the heart of the Fire Nation cities. Zuko just shows up at a point, and suddenly Aang's a master firebender, no different than when Into the Inferno skipped that whole story beat, too. So, hey, I guess taken after their elders or something. And then when you beat the game, if you dare go back into free play mode and play with other characters, the hidden collectibles in each chapter are just randomly sitting somewhere in plain sight. Those collectibles are only collectible because they simply don't spawn outside of free play mode. Look, not every puzzle in this game is awful. Some are creative the first minute or two before they start to overstay their welcome, but that's the only real positive I have with this game. For the first, like, 30 minutes or so, I thought maybe this wasn't as bad as the tea leaves were already starting to indicate. Like, maybe it was flawed, but with some level of promise to it. But shortly after that, it became apparent that no, this is actually just the worst elements of every prior Avatar game wrapped into one. Like, it was some kind of Avatar of the Avatar games itself, except instead of bringing peace, it only brought misery. I, I wish that was some slightly exaggerated point that I was forcing together just to make the Avatar and Elements allegory, but no, it legitimately hits on the worst beats of every other Avatar game that I played before it, and I don't even know how this random studio from Peru managed that, because you know they weren't playing the older games for research, they were too busy cranking out DreamWorks All-Star Kart Racing at the very same time, a game that Game Mill also published only six weeks after this one. I fully understand that Avatar may not be the kind of series that at the current moment, and maybe just forever depending on how that Paramount Plus experiment goes, is going to justify more than a budget title. I get that. But at the very goddamn least, if we're getting games at all, we should be getting games that I could say children by and large could enjoy. There is no market for a game like Quest for Balance outside of preying on the uninformed, hoping that they see it on a shelf at some point during its life and buy it because they or a kid in their life likes Avatar. It will not introduce new fans to the series because it can't even act as a substitute at the most basic level for the series. At least the THQ games, when they were struggling with this same issue, they were coming out within a year or so of that show's season, not 15 years after the finale aired. Kids deserve far better than a game like this. Fans of the series deserve far better as well, and for the record, far better would still only mean mediocre in this case. Hell, Viacom, hear me out here. If you're gonna let them throw out a crappy, low-budget LEGO game knockoff, just suck it up like Disney did and pay Warner Brothers to make a proper LEGO Avatar game series. It would go great with another set of merch to sell like hotcakes while you pretend the series still isn't all that successful. They already did a LEGO Avatar set once before, actually twice before, so it's not a crazy leap to make. And look, I can't blame the development team for cranking out a soulless cash-in, because they're not the ones funding it. I, I can't blame Game Mill, because even if they are a soulless cash-in publisher fighting in a race to the bottom to offer the lowest cost tie-ins, they're just the ones that are handling the cash-in properties that they can get. Neither of these two handled Avatar Generations, after all. The blame starts at the top, and it goes solely in the same wishy-washy hands that have been responsible for this franchise consistently being given breadcrumbs its entire existence, with the exception of maybe the next few years if the shows and movies actually pan out. Quality-wise, I'm sure those shows and movies will pan out if they get that far. There's no reason to doubt the showrunners that have treated the Avatar world and series that they created with respect. But there's also no reason to have anything but cautious, not even optimism, realism, knowing that the moment that its temporary purpose has been filled, there's a good chance the series goes back in the bin until another rainy day. I, I wish I had a better way to close out than that, because those of you that are longtime viewers and subscribers know that my goal at the end of the day is to use games and the stories behind them as a way to ultimately lift up. Instead, this was, this was not very much that. Sure, at least I finally did it, I made the damn video, but go figure, the game I went in knowing was already looking kinda shaky ends up being the worst of them all, and it's the one that got me started on making the video anyway. So, uh, funny how that worked out. Knock on wood, the next proper Avatar game is better. At this point, I'll give up hope on getting a truly great one and settle for another platinum-developed budget title or something like that. Just 
Just, just, just give me something. At this point, it's a sunk cost thing. Look, I don't have a good ending for this one. I'm just gonna go try and forget the last two months happened. So, uh, uh, subscribe. Here's more videos. Join the Discord. As always, until next time, stay golden. If you'd like to watch videos just like this early or even ad-free, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month over at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. You'll also get into the exclusive Golden Cult Discord server and get your name in these credits with fine folks like Rodney220, The Critic of Innocence, Thomas Kuzma, Jump Rock, and so many more. Thank you.